Beware the black cat, it said, for that cat brings evil. We wouldn't believe that nowadays, obviously, but in times past in Appalachia, a black cat was thought of by many folks as a witch's apprentice. Today we tell a tale about a black cat that turned out to be something more. You're listening to Mountain Lore, Tales from Appalachia. Ooh, something more. Oh, yeah, and you'll find out when we get into this story. <laughs> I'm ready. Ah, well, this is a traditional tale from mm-hmm. North Carolina. Mm-hmm. This comes from the book Blue Ridge Country by Gene Thomas. We've done some other stories out of that book as well, but this one, I really, really like this one, and I okay. hope you folks like it as well. Okay. Now, from where old Polly Gentry lived on Rocky Fork of Webb's Creek, she could see far down into the valley and across the ridge on all sides. Now, her house stood at the very top of Hawk's Nest, the highest peak in all the country around. Polly, or Paul as she was called, didn't have an airtight house like those down near the sawmill. She said it wasn't healthy. Hmm. Even when the owner of the mill offered her leftover planks to cover her log house when the chinkin had fallen out, hmm. Paul refused, telling him, The holes let the wind in and the cat out, and the body can't do without either. You see, there was a long, sleek cat with green eyes and fur as black as a crow, seen skulking in and out of Paul Gentry's place. Now, if it met a person as it prowled through the woods, the cat would dart off swift as a weasel into the bush to hide away. Young folks on Rocky Fork of Webb's Creek learned early to snatch off hat or bonnet if the cat crossed their path, spit into it, and put it on quickly again to break the witching they feared would be uh, cast by old Paul Gentry's black cat. Oh. Yeah, that's one of those superstitions they used to tell Mm -hmm. in Appalachia. Kind of like when the cat crosses your path, you're supposed to, you know, Mm -hmm. cross yourself, things like that. It stuck in my head even. Yeah. Yep. Never, Gina were Paul and the cat seen together. Hmm. Truth be told, there were some among the old folks on Rocky Fork who long had vowed that Paul and the cat were one and the same. Mm -hmm. They declared that Paul was a witch in league with the devil and that she could change herself from woman to cat when the spell was strong enough within her, when the evil spirits took a good, strong hold upon her. Moreover, Paul Gentry had but one tooth in her head. (laughs) Mm. one sharp fang in the very front of her upper jaw. According to folks, quote, a woman is bound to be a witch if she just has one tooth. Now, I hadn't heard that. Have you, have you mm, heard that? No. She probably looks like a witch. Well, it's interesting you said that. Let me describe her for you. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Paul Gentry was a frightful creature to look at. Mm. She had a heavy growth of hair cold black hair all around her mouth and particularly upon her upper lip. You know, some of those mm. old women that have mm-hmm. a beard, okay? Speaking of beard, it was plain to be seen even when she turned in a neighbor's lane long before she got to the door. Young children at first sight of her ran screaming to hide their faces in their mother's skirts. That's how oh. ugly she was. Oh. Now, there wasn't a child old enough to give ear to a tale who hadn't heard of Paul Gentry's powers. How she bewitched Dan Eskew's little girl Flossie, for example. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't have happened, some said, if Flossie had, you know, spit in her bonnet with a black cat crossed her path as she trooped through the woods one day gathering wildflowers. That very evening, when she got back home, Flossie sank on the doorstep. The bonnet filled with wildflowers dropped from her arm. She moaned pitifully, holding her head between her hands and swaying back and forth. Mm. Right away, Gina, her head began to swell. And by the time they got word to Seth Ealing, the witch doctor who happened to live in Mossy Bottom, Flossie's head was twice its size. Oh? Can you believe that? No. Indeed, Flossie Eskew's head was as big as a full-grown pumpkin. Well, the minute the wizard laid eyes on the child, he spoke out. Bait up eggshells as fine as you can and give them to this child in a cup of water. If she's bewitched, this mixture will pass through her clear. Uh Orders were promptly obeyed. Flossie drained the cup, but no sooner had Flossie passed the powdered eggshells 
and the witch left her. Her head went back to its natural size, but nevertheless, Flossie Eskew died that <gasps> night. Oh. That witch doctor had been called too late, it appeared. Oh. Some believed in the powers of both, though neither witch nor wizard would give the other a friendly look, much less a word. Mm. Paul Gentry was well, never downright friendly with Annie, though she'd hoe for a neighbor in return for something to eat. My place is too rocky to raise anything. And whatever was given her, Paul would carry home then and there. Them's fine turnips you got there, Mistress Darby. She said one day, and Sally Darby up and handed her a double handful of turnips. <laughs> Paul opened the front of her dirty calico apron, put the turnips inside against her dirty hide, and tripped off with them. Nor was Paul Gentry one to set home at tasks such as you know, knitting or piecing a quilt. But everyone admitted there never was a better hand the country over at raising pigs than Paul Gentry. So she swapped pigs for knitting. She had to have long yarn stockings, mittens, and warm hood, too, for her pigs had to be fed and tended to winter and summer, and she didn't want to freeze when she's outside. Mm -hmm. Others needed meat as much as Paul needed things to keep her warm. Tilly Bocock was glad to knit stockings for the old witch in return for a plump shoat. Now, Tilly had several mouths to feed. Her man was no account, you know. He spent his time fishing in the summer and hunting in the winter, so that all that work fell to who? Mm -hmm. The poor wife. Mm -hmm. Day by day, she tended and fed the shoat. It was black and white spotted and fat as a butterball. She and the little Bocox bragged. <laughs> Old Paul would stop in at Tilly's every time she went down the mountain, eyeing that fat pig. Sometimes she'd put the palms of her dirty hands against her mouth and rub the black hair back to this side and to that side, then she'd stroke her chin as though her black beard hung far down. Wow. Paul would make a clucking sound with her tongue. Wish I was chawing on a juicy spur rib or gnawing me a greasy pig's knuckle right now. Then Paul would begin on a long tale of witchery, how she'd seen young husbands under the spell of her craft grow faithless to young, pretty wives. How children gained power over their parents through her and had their own will in all things, even to getting title to house and land from them before it should have been theirs. She told how Luther Trumbo's John took with barking fits like a dog and became a hunchback overnight. Why? Because he mocked old Paul Gentry, that's why. She rubbed a dirty hand around her hairy mouth and cackled gleefully. At that, Tilly Bocock turned to her frightened children huddled behind her chair and told them to get out to the barn for such witchy talk wasn't fit for young ears. <laughs> well, that didn't set well with old Paul Gentry. Mm. She scowled at Tilly and her sharp eyes flashed and she puffed her lips in and out. Paul didn't say anything, but Tilly could see she was miffed and there was in her sharp eyes a look that said... Never mind, Tilly Bocock. You'll pay for this. Next morning, Paul Gentry was up bright and early, rattling the pot on the stove and grumbling to herself. I'll show Tilly Bocock a thing or two, so I will, sending her young ones out of my hearing. Far down the ridge, Tilly Bocock was up early too, for already the sun was bright and there was corn to hoe. Tilly and the children had washed the dishes, and she carried out the soapy dish water with cornbread scraps mixed in it and poured it in the trough for the pig. Spotty, they called their pet. Mm. The Bococks had no planks with which to make a separate pen for the spotted pig, so they kept its trough in a corner of the chicken lot. Macy, you and Saffron and go fetch a bucket of cold water for Spotty. A pig likes a cold drink now and then, same as we do. So off the children went with the cedar bucket to the spring. When they returned, they poured some of the water into the dishpan, and Spotty sucked it up greedily while they hurried to pour the rest into the mud hole where the pig liked to wallow. Hmm. The sun caked the mud on the pig's sides and legs as it lay grunting contentedly in the chicken yard. <laughs> and when Tilly and the children came in from hoeing corn at dinner time, Spotty still lay snoozing in the sun. An hour later, they returned to toss a handful of turnip greens into the pig. 
But Spotty didn't even grunt or get up, for on its side was a sleek black cat. Um. A cat with green eyes, stretched full length, working its claws into the pig's muddy side, now with the front paws, now with the hind ones. Mm. The children screamed and stomped a foot. Scat, scat, they cried, but the black cat only turned its fierce eyes toward him. Hmm. Hearing their screams, Tilly came running out. She fluttered her apron at the cat to scare it away, but it only snarled, showing its teeth, lifting its bristling whiskers. Hmm. Then Tilly picked up a stone and threw it as hard as she could, striking the cat squarely between the eyes. Oh. It screamed like a human, oh. Tilly said afterwards. Loud and wild it screamed. And leaping off the pig, it darted off quick as a flash. Hmm. When the cat reached the cliff halfway up the mountain that led toward Paul Gentry's, it turned around and looked back. With one paw uplifted, it wiped its face, for there was blood pouring out of the cup between its shining green eyes. It twitched its mouth till the black fur stood up. Tilly and the children coaxed the pig to get up, offering it some more slop. Slowly, the pig got to its knees, then to its feet. It grunted once and then fell over dead. <gasps> oh! After that, old Paul Gentry wasn't seen for days. But when Tilly Bocock did catch sight of her, Paul turned off from the footpath and hurried away. Even so, Tilly saw the deep gash in Paul's forehead, oozing blood right between her eyes. She saw Paul Gentry's mouth widen angrily and the black hair about it twitch like that of a snarling cat as she slunk away. Ooh, boy, they had her figured out, didn't they? Oh, they did indeed, buddy. <laughs> Those folks that said she must have been that cat were absolutely correct. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ooh. That's just evil. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's all I can say. But a good story. Yeah, a good story. Yes. And that story is the tale of the black cat. Another bit of the folklore of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the Mountain Lore Podcast wherever you get your podcast to keep getting our stories. Until next time, as always, sweet dreams, podcast listeners.